Why is it that when someone asks you to just trust them, you just don't? Because trust is tricky. You can't just say it. You have to back it up. AAA Auto Insurance has been doing that for over a hundred years. As quickly as a car accident happens, AAA starts to set things right, matching you with the right experts who make your claim their priority until you're back behind the wheel. Talk to a AAA insurance agent at your local AAA store today or visit AAA.com slash insurance to learn more about AAA. Blog Talk Radio. Healthy and Tone Radio with your host, Darren Batman McDuck. And now, prepare to get fat. What's cracking? Welcome back to another episode of Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. I'm your host, Darren Fatman McDuffie, and this episode is being brought to you by I'm the Fat Man Doc. Com. And I keep saying that I'm going to change the website, and that is actually coming soon. Brand new website, just getting my thoughts in order and getting where I want things to be. But the website will be dedicated to the podcast. When I first started out, everything, it was more dedicated to my blog. But it's going to be showcasing the podcast, and there will also be some other things on there. So hopefully I'll be getting that done here within the next uh, month or so. I'm still figuring out what I want to use, what kind of things I, I want to present on the uh, the website, and uh, it'll be be changing soon, so I'm looking forward. Change is good. Um, excited about tonight's interview. I had to actually interrupt my Game of Thrones viewing. I don't know how many of you out there are Game of Thrones fans, but I had to interrupt my viewing to get everything uh, going and, and uh, kickstart everything into motion, so to speak, to get our guest on. But before I get him on, I wanted to remind you of last week's show. I always remind you of last week's show, which I thought was a really good, uh, enlightening show. I did a show with Dr. Pamela Riley, who's a naturopath out of Indianapolis, Indiana. And we were talking about essential oils. For those of you who know me, I've said it probably a thousand times that I was uh, once a pharmaceutical rep and I sold antibiotics and I came across essential oils a number of years ago, was introduced to them by a friend and have been using them. Lavender is my big favorite uh, for relaxation. Um, Another one is Steve's Blend for colds and flu and viruses and things of that nature. And there's a number of them out there. But we, uh, Dr. Pamela Riley and I, talk a lot about essential oils and things that you can use essential oils for. And again, these things are holistic, they're natural, and they're doing a lot of research studies on them now saying that they are as good and in some cases better than pharmaceutical antibiotics. So go back and check that show out, download it on iTunes, or you can go to blogtalkradio.com and look up Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio and listen to that show. So without further ado, let me read uh, Tim Steele's bio here. And I did his bio myself, so I hope I did him justice. Tim Steele, like most people, is no stranger to weight gain. As an 18-year-old lanky teenager, sounds like myself, he entered the Air Force. During his 21-year 21 21 year stint in the military, he would watch his weight rise. Pizza and beer were the main staples of his diet. When his stint in the military ended, Tim would continue to watch his weight rise and fall as a result of the yo-yo dieting he adhered to while in the military. His health continued to decline until he discovered a paper detailing a potato diet. He adopted a diet consisting of consuming potatoes as the basis for achieving and sustaining weight loss and saw satisfying results. Since then, Tim has helped people shed weight and improve gut health through teaching the art of resistant starch with the potato hack. Tim Steele, welcome to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. Hi, Darren. Yeah, glad to be here. Thank you for being on, man. This thing is... um, I came across this on the internet as you and I were discussing off air from a friend of mine named uh, Rusty Moore, and I didn't take a look at the article. You get so many things thrown at you on Facebook. There's so much chatter going on, and sometimes things get lost in translation. But um, you and I became friends on Facebook, and I started looking at some of your stuff that you were sharing. I was like, wow, I got to get this guy on. But um, 
<laughs> so I was like, let me reach out and get him on and find out what's going on with this this whole potato thing. So here you are, and uh, I wanted to share. I wanted you to share with the audience. Um, I always ask people to share with them their health journey and how you came about discovering this uh, quote unquote potato hack. Yeah, sure. And like you said, I, I joined the Air Force right out of high school. And, uh, you know, till I was 30, I never had to give my weight a second thought. You know, we, we ate just whatever we wanted. And, and uh, you know, in the military, you had to keep your fitness up to a certain standard, you know, with uh, with fitness tests throughout the year and all that. So it was like you were active and you were young and you are just eating and living life. And then you start to get in your 30s, you know, things change a little bit and you start gaining weight. And all of a sudden I had to start thinking, you know, we'd have these, these uh, yearly weigh-ins and my weight max for the Air Force was always 190 pounds or so. And, I, you know, all through my 20s, I stayed in the 170s and, and never never had to even think about it. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to get up into 185, 195, and I'd have to do some kind of quick crash diet to get under my max weight. And then, uh, you know, a week later, I'd be eating back to normal again, and I'd put, put the weight back on, and, and it was just kind of a real struggle to stay close to my max weight you know, so that I could I could melt off a few pounds in a week, you know, with just like starving myself or, you know, sweating it out or whatever, just to try to get under that magic number, which, uh, you know, looking back, it gave me a lot of bad habits. And, uh, and, and I think I think a lot of people get into those same bad habits, you know, they're they're just doing these yo-yo diets to lose a few pounds, but they're never really learning how to eat right. And then I got out of the Air Force in 2004. And I was uh, what about almost 40 years old, and within just a couple of years, I'd went from when I got out, I was about 200 pounds, and uh, within just a few years, I was up to 250 pounds, and I was just a, a total wreck health-wise. I was the uh, poster child for metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'd go to the doctor, and it started out, you know, they said, oh, you, you've got a, a thyroid problem, so they put me on Synthroid. And then I go back in a few weeks, and they say, oh, that's that's not working. We're going to increase the medicine, but, oh, look, your cholesterol is too high, so we're going to put you on statins. So I'm on statins now. Then I come back, and they say, well, your cholesterol is good, but your triglycerides are too high, so we're going to put you on Gem Fibrazil. And I was having some really strange, I was getting these really weird chest coughs. And they said, oh, that's from the statin. Let's, let's put you on a different cholesterol medicine, and we'll increase your your triglycerides, and we're going to need another blood pressure medicine. And, and during this time, I was also getting gout attacks, and uh, my gout attacks went from like once a year to once a month. And so I was on medicines for gout, for cholesterol, triglycerides. I was on two blood pressure medicines. I was on the Synthroid, and there's probably something I'm forgetting, but it was just every time I go to the doctor for five years, it was a new medicine, and my weight was just blowing out of control. I do whatever they said, you know, they say eat lean meat and whole grains and, you know, and, and it's, it's just tough, you know, because you don't, you're, you never really learn to eat that way. You're just, you know, you're eating according to food labels. So when mm -hmm. they tell you to eat that way, you're eating more processed foods trying to adhere to these, uh, you know, their recommendations. And then it was probably about, um, I think it was about 2007 or 2008. I went in and now I'm diabetic. So I'd been pre-diabetic, and they kept telling me to, you know, oh, eat less, eat less sugar, and they'd give me things. And now I'm full-fledged diabetic. Hey, 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 Tim, can you, Tim, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like there was another line going at at one time. It, it sounds fine now, so go ahead. It just okay. sounds weird. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So so I was diagnosed as a diabetic and they gave me a prescription for uh, metformin and I didn't want to admit defeat I didn't want to take the metformin so I uh, I started reading online you know and, and I came across the paleo diet hmm. at that time so so I um, started trying to do that and some low carbing and all that and and my blood my fasting blood glucose was going down and and uh it was actually Mark Sisson's Primal Blueprint, his Mark's Daily Apple website. Have you seen that? Yeah, I know and, Mark Sisson. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I was doing Mark Sisson's plan, and uh, I did that for about a year. And I was eating really low carb, and I, I was losing weight. And within uh, six months or a year, I was off all of my medications. 
and uh, my weight was was dropping pretty good. I was down, you know, into the under well under 200 pounds. And uh, but then, you know, with with the low carb lifestyle, it's really difficult to stick with a low carb diet. And uh, and I was really afraid I was going to start ballooning back up if if you know you let, let these carbs slip back in. So. So the thing with low carb diets is you always want to go lower and lower carb and you know it's like if if you're not losing weight you start cutting carbs even more to where you're on a ketogenic diet even mm-hmm. and I found the less carbs I was eating you know the less I could uh the less I I could exercise and I wasn't feeling so good I wasn't sleeping very good and and uh so I started reading around and uh, at that time a book came out called The Perfect Health Diet and Paul oh, Jamine I'm going to have Paul on. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. oh good. He's, yeah. he's a great guy. Yeah, real, yeah. real good guy. Get him on. Yeah, you'll, you'll mm-hmm. enjoy talking with him. And so, so I kind of switched from Mark Sisson's low-carb paleo to uh, the perfect health diet where I was adding back in these uh, starches and potatoes and rice. And I was, I was actually talking with Paul quite a bit, and uh, he, he said a lot of the magic of the potatoes is resistant starch you know and that got me thinking about resistant starch and all this and uh, it was also about that time chris voigt he was the washington state potato commissioner he did a uh, little publicity stunt for potatoes and he ate just potatoes for 60 days and surprisingly he he couldn't eat enough potatoes even to maintain his weight and so he wasn't even that overweight and he lost about 60 pounds or something like that in his 60 days and uh so so that came about and the perfect health diet came about and all these things kind of intersected in my life so i was trying to lose like i was down to like lose one to lose about 15 20 more pounds and I thought, I'm going to try this potato diet, you know. And uh, so I just started eating potatoes, and I did it for two weeks the first time. And I think I lost 10 pounds in the first two weeks. And then the next week when I started eating normally, I kept losing weight. So I was down about 15, you know, 15, 20 pounds in, in about three weeks after, you know, a two-week potato diet. So I started talking about it on different forums and that and chatting with different people and putting the ideas out there and getting a bunch of other people to try it. And this was back in 2012, I guess, 2011, 2012. And, and, uh, we started talking about it on different forums and, uh, you know, and, and the conversation kind of always would morph into resistant starch and then into gut health and, and all that. But people kept really interested in the potato diet and everybody was calling it the potato hack. I never, I didn't really like that term cause it just sounded kind of strange, but but it kind of grew on me, and uh, after all these years, then everybody kept kept saying, "Oh, you should write a book about this." And and I'd been talking about it so much, and had so many notes and uh, so many files on my computer, you know. So I just sat down last winter and just uh, sat down and wrote a book about it, and that's how it all came about. Yeah, and <clears throat> this paper that you kind of came across, this paper was actually written in. I know that you said you found uh, was it Chris Chris Boyd, but this paper that you you stumbled upon was written in 1849. Am I am I correct when I say that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, one day I was searching on the internet, you know, and uh, I just typed in I think the term potato diet, and up came this old book from 1849, and uh, it was written in New York, and now 1849 was just like a year after the big potato famine in Ireland. So you had millions of uh, Irish immigrants coming to America and in New York, so you can imagine that potatoes were probably pretty popular there. And uh, and it's funny, but back in 1849, they were talking about how people were getting fat and dyspeptic is the term they used, meaning they had a lot of digestive problems. And you think that's more of a modern problem, but, you know, they were having these same things back in 1849 in New York, and uh, so what the what the doctors did is put people on this potato diet, and it was just eating potatoes, plain potatoes, you know, for for just um, a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And and what they noticed is the people were all losing weight, and their digestion was better. And they didn't really have much explanation for it. They just said it worked, you know, and, and the people were doing it. And and it was just kind of lost to you know this obscure journal for the next you know hundred and some years till I found it, I guess. Mm-hmm. You mentioned, you know, kind of yo-yoing on your weight, and I've had that experience myself with, you know, losing some weight, gaining some weight, and losing some weight. And it wasn't really till my late 
30s that I discovered, you know, and this might, might not be for everybody, I discovered just taking gluten out of my diet, and that seems to regulate. But I'm wondering, what are the results of the potato hack? If you are using these potatoes to lose weight, let's say you have to go to that graduation, you want to lose those 10 pounds. And a lot of people kind of resign themselves to using these crash diets and eliminating carbs and and doing just crazy things to lose five to 10 pounds for that high school uh, reunion. (laughs) So I'm wondering if the potato hack is subject to that. If you go off of this, are you going to gain that weight back? Or is it something that happens to make you sustain that weight loss over a period of time? Well, more than likely, if you have a bad diet to begin with and you're just you know, right. 10 pounds overweight and you use the potato hack and you lose 10 pounds and then you just go right back to the way you're eating, yeah, you're going to gain the weight right back. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I like to use the potato hack as an introduction into better ways of eating. You know, and what, one thing, one, one group of people that find the potato hack really useful are people who have been trying to diet and, and they, mm. they just seem to think that their metabolism is broken and they can't lose weight. And, and they try these different diets and they lose a couple pounds and then they gain it right back, you know, the next week. Because a lot of the diets, what you're losing is water weight. And, uh, you know, that just like you lose it fast, but then it comes right back on. But with the potato diet, what it seems more is you're losing fat. You know, you're you're actually losing body fat when you do it. So when you come off of the potato diet, you you don't gain that weight right back. In fact, most people, even if they start eating their normal diet, will lose another couple pounds the next week because they've actually lost fat and they've increased their metabolism. But if they don't make some changes, they're not going to be long-lasting changes. But the long-lasting changes are more mental because they see that this potato hack actually worked. They actually were able to lose weight and and keep it off, and that there is something wrong with their with their present diet that's making them gain the weight right back. So I think the potato hack is a good introduction into a new way of eating for people, because people real you know people know that this yo-yo dieting isn't good. I mean, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's it's probably the worst way you can live. Is it, that that probably does wreck your metabolism over time. But you know. If, but but I, in the book, I give a couple different examples of different diets to go on. You know, Mark Sisson's Primal Blueprint, and uh, you know, there's there's a lot of good diets out there. Angelo Coppola has one called the Plant Paleo Diet that he's working on, mm-hmm. and it's it's, a, it's 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 almost a vegan diet, but he includes meat, you know, cheese and some some eggs and milk and that. So, but it's mostly plants, and uh, I, I think people find if if they eat lots and lots of plants really healthy plants and lots of whole food that they don't really have a, uh, a weight problem anymore. They, they can lose all the weight they want and, and eat as much as they want. Now with these potatoes, one of the things that I was always hesitant about when it comes to potatoes is the starch content and the fact that the starch content could raise my blood sugar levels. And I kind of stayed away from potatoes for um, a long time. Um, why is it that when you're doing this potato hack, and I kind of don't like that either, <laughs> that, that terminology <laughs> yeah. either. But why is it? It made a good you, title for a book. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's catchy and people kind of relate to it. But um, why is it that you're not going to be worried about these fluctuations in your blood sugar if you're just eating potatoes? Yeah, you know, and that that's. Uh... Exactly what I did too. I, I, I'm a big gardener and I, I grow potatoes and there was probably a four or five year period where I didn't grow potatoes just because they were so, you know, so carby. I, you know, everybody was, was afraid of carbs and especially they would say white carbs. So potatoes are just really easy to recognize as a carb. And uh, but, but potatoes themselves really don't have that many carbs in there. Uh, for instance, when you're doing the potato hack diet, if you're eating three pounds of potatoes a day, that's only 270 some grams of carbs, and that that's less than most people eat, you know, in their regular diet, unless you're on some kind of low carb diet. But uh, it's not they're not that carb heavy, and uh, when you're doing when you're eating just potatoes, something really strange happens with people's blood glucose, and uh, even diabetics, they're they're 
their fasting blood glucose normalizes usually within just a few days. And uh, if, if people track their, their, you know, their postprandial glucose spikes, they'll find they can eat a meal of potatoes in the morning and, uh, you know, their, their, their blood sugar will spike like normal and, uh, and, and then it comes back down to baseline. Then their second meal, it doesn't spike near as high because of some second meal effect. And mm-hmm. then after about two days, their fasting glucose is down to maybe even normal or, you know, you know, well into the normal range, and they they can even slow down their their medicine if they're on it, like metformin. And uh, yeah, lots of people find that after three or four days they're no longer diabetic. But you know, once they go back on their normal diet and they start adding back in fat and sugar and all the other foods, then then the symptoms come back and they need to get back on their medicine. But yeah, for even for most diabetics, you know, if you're diabetic and you want to try this, I, I highly urge it. But, you know, track your blood sugars and, and you, you know what you can live with and uh, take your medicine and just, just keep an eye on things. But most people are really amazed at how after about two or three days their, their FBG normalizes and their, their postprandials aren't near as big as what they would think they would be. Mm-hmm. What makes potatoes so good? I mean, it's got to have something in there <laughs> that is going to sustain me. If I'm eating a period like when I was uh, just, you know, checking out the book and reading someone to prepare for the interview, <clears throat> you're telling people to do this for three to five days. I mean, <clears throat> it's a normal potato. <clears throat> excuse me. A normal potato it's got to have some type of nutrition in there to make the body to be able to subsist on just potatoes for that number of days. So what's making the body, what's so good about the potato? Yeah, potatoes really, I mean, they're, they're a nutritional powerhouse. I mean, they, they're able to sustain life. I say three to five days in the, in the, in the book, but that's just to keep people kind of interested in doing this because it, it's it's tough to eat just potatoes. It gets old, and you know, then the weekends come, and and then then you go out, you know, and you eat a regular meal, and you think you blew it or whatever. But I just like you know, three to five days is usually enough to see some weight loss. But you could actually eat potatoes probably for the rest of your life and uh, and not have much other foods, and, and you would thrive. There's a guy right now. His name is Andrew Taylor from Australia. You can find him on Facebook and on, on YouTube. He, go, he also goes by Spud Fit. And he's doing an experiment. Have you heard of him? No, I just I just like that name, Spud Fit. But, yeah, it's a great <laughs> no, name. No, no, no. It's real catchy. Yeah. Yep. But look him up, and, and he'd be a great guest to get on here, too. Um, he's a really fun guy to talk to. But he started, uh, he, he, was, he was about 300 pounds at the first of the year. And he was uh, diagnosed with some depression issues, and he was a food addict, binge eater, mm-hmm. and he was he's also vegan. And uh, so he wanted to do something to completely uh, break his addiction to food and, and lose some weight. And, and this would be he, we didn't know each other. It, he, I was finishing up the book just as he was starting his diet, and we kind of we kind of met in about in February, started sharing some notes. But, yeah, he's going for a whole year of eating nothing but potatoes. He's also using sweet potatoes. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yes, yeah, since so the 1st of January he started, this is middle of May, you know, so he's like, what, 140, 150 days in. And he's lost, uh, I think, nearly 100 pounds already. And he wow. had some blood tests done at day 100, and his uh, cholesterol went from 166 down to 112. The doctor who was reading his labs read it, and he says, "Wow, that's better than my patients on statins." <laughs> and uh, all of his blood labs looked good. There was no problems with his blood labs at all after 100 days on all potatoes. And uh, you know, in in history, there's also other examples of civilizations that subsisted just on potatoes for long periods of time. In, in Ireland, you know, the people became so dependent on potatoes that once there was the uh, the potato um, blight hit the crops and all the potatoes you know died they didn't have anything to eat so millions of people starved to death and had to leave the country and all that but you know they were for like 100 and some years they were eating mostly potatoes in their diet and they were eating like 10 to 15 pounds of potatoes a day the hard working men and uh and they thrived you know the population of ireland went from like a million to what eight million people in just you know 100 years in the 1840s and, and the people were thriving on it. And they they were eating mostly potatoes. They were eating oats, and uh, some of the people had cows, so they had access to milk. 
But what I read mostly is, is the people that had milk were selling the milk to people that could afford it so they could pay rent or things like that. And the people were pretty much just eating potatoes in Ireland in the 1840s. And uh, throughout history, too, there's lots of, um, lots of tales of prisoners, you know, during prison, you know, wartime being fed just potatoes for long periods of time. Um, and then also, you know, way back when in the, in the Andes in South America, the, the different populations that lived down there, like the Mayans, you know, they had potatoes, and that was, that was their staple food down there. And, you know, they had huge civilizations, you know, that, that were based on potatoes. Yeah, this this gentleman who um, the Spud Fit guy, you said he was 300 pounds. Um, I'm wondering if it's going to be different. Your your diet, your potato diet, is going to be different for. Um, I mentioned earlier in the interview someone who wants to lose the five to ten pounds to uh, go to their high school reunion versus someone who's that. I would say was chronically obese and they're looking to finally turn their life around, looking to lose more than a hundred pounds or so. Is this diet, what differences can we see in the diet? Are we eating more potatoes? Are we staggering the potatoes at different times? What, what happens for that five to 10 pound last 10 pounds? Cause I believe you said in the book, you were always had those stubborn 10 pounds that was lying around, but what's the yep. difference in someone who's, trying to lose that last 10 versus someone who's like, hey, I'm 300 pounds. I really need to get my weight down because I need my health back. Yeah, sure. Yeah, in the book, I give different examples of all different kinds of weight loss scenarios, you know, stubborn dieters, you know, people who've been on diets their whole life, and they, but they're still 100 pounds overweight, people who are the first-time dieters, and people who just want to lose the last 5 pounds or 10 pounds, and you know, you know, and everybody in between, and I kind of give different scenarios and different ways they can do it and some different variations. Some people do good eating, like they'll just eat potatoes during the day. Breakfast and lunch is just potatoes, and they eat a normal dinner. People lose, you know, long term, they can lose weight that way. Um, eating potatoes one day and then eating regular the next, you know, they, they call that kind of an up-day, down-day approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, there's some, you know, there's some big diet industries kind of built around that they call it the johnson's up day down day diets mm -hmm. and uh that works also really well with potatoes you know one day eat potatoes the next day eat regular and uh i think once you know once you start losing weight and realize that this whole food approach is working then the days that you're eating normal i think you're more mindful of what you're eating because you don't want to don't want to lose those the losses that you had made so you start thinking more about what you're eating on the days that you're eating regular food and I like people to think, you know, that you just need to get away from this standard American diet of fast food and soda pop and fried food and vegetable oils and added sugar to everything. And, you know, it's nice with the potato hack because they can actually learn to eat right as they're losing weight. And it's not like Weight Watchers where you have these points that you have to go by or, you know, these other diets that you have to buy special meals or special bars or special shakes or whatever, because those diets you never really learn how to eat right. You know, with the, with the potato diet, it's a real food that you're eating. It's not costing you anything. In fact, the diet portion is cheaper than your normal day because potatoes are cheap. And, uh, but then you need, to just, you need to learn how to eat right. You know, to, to, to make this last is, is going to be up to you. You need to find some kind of good diet a whole food diet and just just stick with it and and use the potatoes to to you know kind of blast that fat off real fast and then get onto a maintenance diet and use the potatoes to blast some more and that's what I tell people who are like 100 pounds overweight mm -hmm. do this 3 to 5 days a week for as many weeks as it takes and your weight will drop at a linear rate all throughout you know as you're doing it and uh then you'll find out on your if you're doing it say 5 days a week you know, then, then the weekends you eat normally, you're probably not going to gain the weight back. You know, you, you probably won't gain any weight back on that weekend. And the next week you lose, you know, three or four more pounds. And then, you know, but along the way you need to really be thinking about what you're eating on your normal maintenance diet. And, uh, that, you know, that, that's, that's the part I really like about it. And people see that, that they need whole foods, they need fiber, they uh, don't need a lot of fat, you know, because there's these high-fat diet fads and, you know, low carb fads. So people learn that carbs aren't really their enemy, and they learn that you know all different things about eating. But uh, yeah, 
Yeah, just, yeah. A, just a whole relationship with food. Yeah. You mentioned uh, metabolic syndrome, and one of the things that usually – a company's metabolic syndrome is higher blood pressure, and um, you know, thumbing through your your uh, ebook and and reading a lot of things, I saw that potas- I mean, not uh, potatoes had sodium and potassium, and a lot of people because they have high blood pressure, that balance is usually off. And I'm wondering, I don't know if there are any studies out there or you come across anyone who's done this diet where they've had any instances where they've been able to lower their their blood pressure using this. Oh yeah, I, I hear that all the time from people that that they 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 pretty much get off their blood pressure medicines if if they do this for a while and then they start mm-hmm. learning how to eat, you know, and they transition away from sad especially, but uh, yeah, the, the balance of sodium and potassium in potatoes is incredible, you know, on a on a potato diet if you're eating you know roughly three pounds of potatoes a day, you're getting about. 5,000 milligrams or 5 grams of potassium, and you're getting about 54 milligrams of sodium, so less than a half a gram of sodium. And, uh, you know, normally the guidelines are they want you to eat less than, what is it, they want you to eat less than, um, uh, less than 1,000 milligrams, so less than 1 gram of sodium and more than 4,500 milligrams of potassium. That's, that's the mm-hmm. recommendations. And it's completely skewed for most people. Most people are eating more than four grams of sodium and less than a thousand grams of potassium. But when you're doing this potato diet, you're eating less than a hundred grams of sodium and more than you know five thousand grams or five thousand milligrams of potassium. So so the balance is completely in favor of potassium. And uh, most people like to put salt on their potatoes, and it's fine on on the potato diet because you have plenty of room to get some sodium in your diet if you like the taste of salt. So, yeah, uh, yeah the, the balance of sodium and potassium is way off in the in the American diet, and that, that is really killing people, you know, with kidney stones, stroke, osteoporosis, you know, just overall inflammation from, from that yeah. when that gets balance. And, you yeah. know, it all has to do with electrolytes and, the, you know, the, the balance of fluids in the body it makes a big difference. Yeah, um... I guess I should ask you what kind of potatoes, because people are going to be listening to the interview. Uh, gonna like, yeah, hey, that, what that's in the book a lot. I it, it, it's I'll amazing, know. you know, when you talk about eating potatoes, all of a sudden people are realizing, man, I don't know much about potatoes. <laughs> and uh, mostly it's just it's what you call the white potatoes and uh, as opposed to sweet potatoes. And it's, you know, the russets, the red potatoes, the, the Yukon golds, the, you know, any, any kind of potatoes. If you go in a supermarket and they say potato it's fine as long as it's not a sweet potato or a yam. You know you you can use them, and uh, yeah, it's just really any kind of potato. Now, can we use something like? Because I know there's somebody out there wondering about this, and I those questions like, oh my God, did he really ask that? And I'm really going <laughs> to ask it, folks. Um, can you use French fries? Can you use mashed potatoes, or is it strictly a whole potato? Okay, um, it needs to be low fat. So whatever you do, it just you can't have any fat. So you can make some really delicious French fries in your oven. You just cut the potatoes thin, put them on a rack in your oven at about 450 degrees for about 30 minutes, and they come out good. And, and it's funny, I, I have a whole bunch of recipes in the book for different ways of cooking potatoes without oil. And most of these recipes you will find that you like so well, that will be your normal way to eat potatoes afterwards. Um, Mashed potatoes I've been making, and I use a little bit of um, beef broth or vegetable broth or even, you know, chicken broth. You look look on the the nutrition that it's like zero fat, zero protein, a little bit of maybe sodium in there, but it's just flavoring, flavored water, some gelatin maybe in there. Make make, uh, mashed potatoes and use um, beef broth instead of butter and, you know, milk, how you normally make them, you know, mash them up, and uh, they're they're really good. And, yeah, you can eat a, a lot of mashed potatoes, and uh, and they fill you up pretty quick. Yeah, I didn't know if, you know, if you could use, you just had to use the whole potatoes, or you could do something mashed or uh, fries or anything like that. But it sounds like yeah, you can have. Yeah, any way you want, as long as you don't, not, not drenching them in fat. Right, and you said you you can use salt if you want to. Yep, salt's fine, vinegar's fine, pepper, and really, really any spices are good. 
in in the book I lay out a uh, a plan. It's it's just like got seven kind of rules, and and those are based off the 1849 plan, you know. And they said no salt, no pepper, you know, no fat. So I kind of lay it out like that, and I like people to try that at least for a day, just to see what it's like to do that 1849 diet plan because you will almost without a doubt guaranteed lose weight at about a half a pound to a pound a day if you do it that way. But then people want to try their own little things, you know. So over the years, everybody's, you know, given me new ideas, and, and we try them out. And uh, so I got a whole bunch of different ways in the book, different um, different variations of the potato diet, you know, using some people like to eat a little bit of meat, you know, and we found out if you, like, maybe eat the meat for lunch just on its own and then later in the day have your, have your supper of uh, just potatoes, the weight loss seems to stick. Um, pretty much any spices are fine with with mm-hmm. it, and uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of different variations. But it, it, your, your calories are you know about ninety nine percent going to be coming from potatoes. Yeah, um, getting into sweet potatoes, I think you mentioned that the Spud Fit guy was using sweet potatoes, but what's the difference in the white potatoes and the sweet potatoes and actually um, what do you recommend? Yeah. Sweet potatoes are just a completely different plant. You know, they're, uh, they're part of the morning glory family and uh, they're, they're more, they're higher sugar content, different fiber content. They're just, they're just completely different, you know, and, and somebody might be able to, you know, use sweet potatoes along with, with the white potatoes, but I, I've never tried it out. And, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I tell people, I, I wrote in the book cause everybody asks this question, so don't feel bad, but everybody wants, everybody says, what about sweet potatoes? I like them better. And mm-hmm. so that might be a <laughs> sweet potato hack. You can try that and let us know how it works. But, mm-hmm. but, you know, the, there's no, uh, no, you know, precedence I could find for eating just sweet potatoes. I think they're kind of a relatively um, not widely eaten crop. You know, now yams are a little bit different. I think this this uh, hack would work with yams, but the trouble is uh, in the states, especially, nobody really knows the difference between a yam and a sweet potato, and we use the term interchangeably. But they're a completely different plant. Um, the the yams are native to uh, West Africa, kind of where life began, you know, for humans. And uh, throughout history, I think people lived eating yams for you know millions of years. And uh, they're they're full of resistant starch and the uh, and fiber and stuff. Pretty pretty close to like a, a regular potato is. But it's just a, the problem is it, it's kind of a foreign food to us. I mean, I I go to the store and something's labeled yams, but it looks just like a sweet potato and. Uh, I don't know that it's really a yam. And then there's probably some kind of yams that are, you know, bred to be higher in sugar. So I, I really don't know much about yams. But, uh, I, you know, I think they're good food for a normal part of your diet, sweet potatoes and yams. But just for the potato hack diet, stick with mm-hmm. uh, regular white potatoes. And i got to ask you this as well. Um, if you are going to use the whole potato itself, is it skin on, skin off? Does it matter and bake or, or boil? It yeah, doesn't it matter. doesn't matter. The uh, skin mm-hmm. on or skin off is kind of up to you. I, I usually recommend if you buy the potatoes in a supermarket and they're just in a big bag and they don't look all that great, I peel them. If they're organic potatoes or potatoes that you grew or bought at a farmer's market and the skins look real good, eat the skins. You know, there, there's there's nothing wrong with the skin. Um, it's just some sometimes I worry on sweet or on supermarket potatoes. The, the the skin takes the brunt of all the you know the pesticides and herbicides and anything that might have been used on that potato so peel that off and then there's no doubt that you're you're getting rid of the you know the worst stuff that could ever be on a potato but uh, most people I think you leave the peels on I, I I'm about probably 75 percent I leave them on and sometimes I peel them and uh, as far as baking and boiling it makes no difference uh, what I always recommend is for people to boil up a big batch of potatoes the very first night, like maybe 10 or 15 pounds, and then put them in Ziploc bags and keep them in the refrigerator so you have some ready-cooked potatoes to eat the next day or, you know, for snacks. And then when you want to eat them, you can take them out of the refrigerator, dice them up, and uh, put them in a pan and heat them back up, heat them up in the microwave. Just It, does, it doesn't really matter. You just got to get them inside you. Yeah. Um, 
second half of the show, I think we got maybe 20 more minutes or so. I don't know if I can keep you a little bit longer because I got some questions. But um, obviously on any diet, there are things that can go wrong. Um, what happens when someone is on this and they are gaining weight instead of losing weight? What I mean, you've been doing this for a while. You've probably been working with the different people or been in different forms. Um, what are some things that you would suggest if someone – is gaining weight instead of losing the weight on this particular diet? Yeah, you know, it's pretty rare that anybody's going to be gaining weight, especially long term. <laughs> Somebody might try it and say, oh, I, I ate potatoes for a full day and I weighed the next morning and I was two pounds heavier. And so, so this is a bunch of crap. I'm never doing it again. But people's weight just fluctuates normally. And uh, if you're eating three pounds of potatoes a day, which is about the average of what most people will eat when they're doing this potato diet, you're only getting just a little over a thousand calories. So if if you figured out a way that you can get fat on a thousand calories, uh, you know you probably need to go and donate your body to science or something because uh, <laughs> most people aren't going to gain weight at a rapid rate on on a thousand calories a day. If you do gain a lot of weight, you know it's from some kind of inflammation. Maybe you got some kind of strange allergy that that makes you, uh, you know, in, get inflamed massively from potatoes. Of course, just, just quit eating potatoes. And uh, But, yeah, if it's not working for you, just, just move on. You know, there's there's no shame in trying it and then not liking it. Some people try it and just hate it. You know, the first day is like, there is no way I could eat potatoes. If this is what it takes to lose weight, I'd rather be fat, you know. And, yeah, uh, yeah but it's not for everybody. And, uh, you know, like usually when I do it, like if I do it for five days, and I'll do it a couple times a year just messing around, but like say I'll start out at like say 180, and then usually I eat potatoes for a full day. The next day I'll probably weigh in at, at the same 180, and then like a day later, you know, like on a, on the second day it'll be like I'll drop a pound and then drop another pound and then maybe stay the same and then maybe even go up a pound. But, you know, overall your your weight trend is downward when you're doing the potato diet. Yeah. What about hunger? Because we were talking about diets earlier, and I know I can attest, and you probably can too, is that when you try to go on a diet, the main thing is you get hungry, and then the diet goes out of the window. When you're doing this whole potato thing, is there, are you going to get hungry? You know, you probably will, um, and it just depends on your relationship with food, too. Everybody's different. Most people say, I love it because I, I, I'm eating and I'm not hungry. And it's, a lot of people say, for the first time in my life, I wasn't hungry. And, you know, people with binge eating disorders love the potato hack because they can eat potatoes, they're not overeating, and they find out all of a sudden they're just not hungry. And it's something, something in your mind kind of clicks because you're, you're telling yourself, all I'm going to eat is potatoes, and you know everything else is off limits. And, and right. it's just that since all those choices are out the window and all you have is potatoes, you know, you, you have to make a conscious decision to eat another potato. And you go, you know, it's like a lot of times, like, I, I'll, you know, I'll be after dinner, I'll be kind of walking around feeling a little hungry and open up the pantry and I'll see, you know, some jelly beans and some nuts. And, I'll, you know, I think, oh, let me have a little bit of this, you know. But when you're on a potato diet, everything, there's nothing else allowed, you know, just potatoes. So you got to be pretty darn hungry to eat a, a, another potato. <laughs> and uh, But, yeah, I, I'm really happy people with uh, eating disorders, you know, binge eating especially, will, will say for the first time ever they, they felt they had their binge eating under control. And uh, they really, really loved it. But, yeah, you, yeah. you can be hungry, sure, you know. Yeah. I just wanted to make that clear because a lot of times that's what throws a lot of people off when they they go on to um, a diet. But like you said, when you make up that – when you make that decision and you it clicks in your mind and you know um, – Let's get into the science of this because we've been throwing some terms around, and I'm sure a lot of people out there who are not as astute as – Many with nutrition and, and the terms, um, you mentioned resistant starch a couple of times. What exactly is uh, resistant starch? Right. So resistant starch is uh, it's regular starch that's found in all plants and uh, plants and seeds and nuts and things like that. And uh, starch is a storage organ for the for the plant. You know, it's how it saves up its energy, like in the potato. It fills itself full of starch so that it can survive the whole winter and then start to grow again. 
And uh, so the starch, when you cook it, it all turns like to jelly. And then when you eat it, you have enzymes in your stomach that break down the starch and it enters your bloodstream as glucose and it's all digestible. But potatoes, uncooked potatoes and potatoes that have been cooked and then cooled, they form what's called a resistant starch. And this starch is so tightly packed into starch granules and different little structures that your digestive enzymes cannot break it down. So it bypasses your whole digestive system in the small intestine and it enters into your large intestine still intact. And once it gets into your large intestine, your large intestine is filled with uh, gut you know, bacteria that degrade different food and turn them into you know, different compounds. And they really like this resistant starch. And uh, the, the bacteria that degrade it, they produce butyrate, which is a short-chain fatty acid, which is a really healthy um, fat for your, for your colon, the, the cells that line your colon. They absorb mm-hmm. the short-chain fatty acid butyrate. And, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's, really, it's really healthy. You know, these gut microbes that you have in your, in your large intestine, you know, fed these different fibers, especially resistant starch. They uh, do things like um, inhibit colon cancer. They boost your immune system. They'll reduce your glycemic response to food that you eat. And, uh, it all, you know, it's also it lowers the calorie intake of the food and the glycemic impact and all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, resistant starch is, is pretty incredible. It's only been studied for about the last uh, 30 years, and uh, it is just exploding on the, on the nutritional scene and how to get more resistant starch into your diet. So the normal diet only has maybe like 5 grams a day of resistant starch, you know, and we're supposed to get like 40 grams of fiber a day, but most people are rarely getting over 10 or 15 but they're finding if you can eat foods that are high in resistant starch and made even higher by, by cooling them down and then you, you know reheating them, they still have this resistant starch in there. So so now your fiber intake went from you know 10 or 15 grams to you know 25 to 40 grams like it's supposed to be. Yeah, and th- these potatoes. I was when I was reading, I came across um, something that says potatoes can both be uh, prebiotic and probiotic. Am I right in saying yeah, that? Yeah, that's kind of kind of some new science behind that. The potatoes themselves actually have bacteria inside of the cells. When you plant a potato, it's not sterile at all, and it, and it needs those bacteria to uh, make the make the potato sprout. If you would sterilize a potato somehow, get rid of all the bacteria that's inside of it, then it won't sprout and. Uh, so, so you know, you've heard of like nitrogen fixing bacteria and you know uh-huh. the bacteria in the soil that, that live inside the plant roots. Yeah, the, the potato itself has bacteria inside of it, living inside amongst these starch granules. So even when you cook the potato, these bacteria are still you know coming into your system and your immune system senses them, and they just act like a probiotic. Yeah, well, one of the things I came across that kind of uh, alarmed me a bit, and maybe you can talk more on this and maybe I might not even have it in the right frame of mind but um, glycoalkaloids it seems as though those were uh, harmful in a sense and I'm wondering if there's a way does the cooking of the potato kind of maybe put someone out of harm's way when they are eating you know eating the potato if I have that yeah um, you know the, the main glycoalkaloid in potatoes is called solanine. There, there's two, mm-hmm. solanine and choconine. And those are usually the ones that people pick on to say that potatoes are unhealthy. And, right. you know, it's a member of the nightshade family. So it has these glycoalkaloids on there that are, they're, they're something that the plant, the potato plant produces so that animals don't eat it. They're mostly in the leaves and stems of the plant. But if a potato, you know, in the natural environment, a potato kind of works its way up from the dirt and it's laying on the surface where the sun hits it, it's going to turn green and produce these glycoalkaloids so that it's protecting itself because animals are going to eat it and get sick and then they realize they shouldn't eat potatoes. You know, it's just a protection that the potato evolved. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's hardly hardly any of that in, in commercial potatoes. It's like the... Uh, 
there's just little tiny bits of, of the solanine in there, and, and the, the potatoes that are grown today are specifically bred to be low in solanine and the, and the glycoalkaloids that would be poisonous. So the only way you're going to have trouble with these glycoalkaloids is if you're eating potatoes that were left out you know, in the, on the counter for weeks and they're, they're turned green and they're starting to sprout. Those, those, those potatoes are bad, but you know, people know how to eat potatoes. You know, potatoes are the third largest food vegetable eaten in the world. You know, yeah. every, almost everybody eats potatoes every day, and people aren't dropping dead of, of uh, solanine poisoning anywhere. Yeah, there's so, it's, it's, real, it's really kind of an overblown an overblown argument. Yeah, there's also something that's very interesting. I started digging around uh, last night, <laughs> and I got into one of what I call my nutrition nerd spasms. And uh, I found out that uh, you mentioned in the book that um, is it called kenorenic acid. Uh, which the yeah. potato has, um, turns out that that is a metabolite of tryptophan. And then right. uh, I stu- I was researching that um, it's also anti-excitotoxic and also anti, I think, anti-convulsive. So I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, wow, maybe potatoes are good to counteract uh, something like MSG because MS- MSG is an excitotoxin. And then mm-hmm. um, you have people who might have, but I, I've, I've started digging into this, like people who have epilepsy and they, they suffer from seizures or convulsions. Or would, would a potato be good for them to put potatoes in their diet? I don't know if there's any studies out that, but my mind just kind of starts working like that when I come across different things. <laughs> <laughs> the but amazing I, rabbit holes you get into. People would say, yeah, how can you yeah. write a whole book about eating potatoes? But it's amazing, isn't it, The rat, where the yeah. rabbit holes take you on this? Yeah, and I was like, I need to start digging myself back out of this. Because, but I just want to ask you about <laughs> yeah. that because I know you've kind of done the, the science behind it, but it, it would be interesting. But I just found a lot of conflicting reports that potatoes weren't good for people who had epilepsy. But, I mean, I'm trying to see why not just because of, you know, the properties of the, the kenorenic acid. Um, yeah, I, I, want, I don't know about how it affects epileptics, but, uh, yeah, this, this uh, kenorenic acid, K-Y-N-A they call it, Mm-hmm. Um, it's really important in our bodies, and uh, we can't metabolize enough of it from from tryptophan in our bodies to to uh, supply our bodies with enough of the KYNA that we need. So mm-hmm. it, most of it comes from the foods that we eat, and most of the KYNA in humans comes from potatoes. And because uh, potatoes are widely eaten, you know, French fries, potato chips, they all have have the kyneronic acid in them still. And, uh, yeah, it's really important. They, they call it a neuroprotective, um, ne- neuroprotective anti-inflammatory antioxidant, and uh, they call it anti-proliferative, meaning that it can slow tumors and cancers, you know. So, yeah, it's really important. That the, in the two biggest sources of KYNA in the diet are potatoes and uh, honey are, are the two largest sources and then in much lesser amounts, like, you know, hundreds of times less in other vegetables and plants. But the biggest source in, in the diet is potatoes and honey. And it's funny, when you go on diets, those are two things that you give up right away. You give up potatoes and honey because a potato is nothing <laughs> yeah. but a big carb and a honey is just a right. big pile of sugar. Yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted to get into the a couple of different things because I know that um, we're kind of digging into the hole and that's exactly where I wanted to go uh, with regards to your weight set point. Um, a lot of people out there may not know about the weight set point, but tell us how potatoes actually help with the kind of resetting your, your weight set point. Yeah, there, there's a, a lot of um, disconnected theories on that, you know, that I think kind of all fit together when you, when you take them in the context of the potato hack diet. Um, the blandness of the food. There's there's food reward theories, you know, that say like as all these really tasty foods are all around us, your body's trying to drive you to eat them, so so it starts increasing your weight set point so that you can put on weight, you know, kind of ancestrally, you know, like in the fall of the year when all these sweet apples are laying around, it wants you to go out there and gorge and pack on some weight for the winter. But you know, in the land of plenty that we live in now, you know, we, we're just surrounded by tasty foods all the time. But when you're doing this potato diet, you're just you're eating this really bland food, but you're getting a lot of it. So your body, I think, is kind of saying, you know, 
okay, we'll give this guy a break. We won't make him so hungry, and we'll let him use his body fat and lean out a little bit till we get past this uh, hump in uh, no food supply. And uh, but yeah, it's it's really it's really quite amazing though that this diet keeps your weight down even after you're off of it, and mm-hmm. and. and Almost everybody notices that. Like when they go back to their normal diet the next week, they're expecting to gain all the weight right back because they're so used to that happening. And it, and it usually doesn't happen with the potato diet. It's like you lose you lose four or five pounds, you know, while you're doing it. Then the next week you're eating normally, the weight stays off. You might even lose another another pound or two. And uh, so yeah, I think there there's a lot of evidence that shows that it's lowering your actual weight set point. Yeah, we talked a little bit about blood sugar at the beginning, but I wanted to talk more about uh, just insulin sensitivity because, I mean, it's well known that fasting helps with your your insulin sensitivity, but I had no idea that potatoes, uh, actually doing this type of potato hack or potato diet actually helps with that as well. Explain a little bit about that. Yeah, mostly I think that has to do with the effects of the gut bacteria on glucose sense you know glucose uh sensitivity the 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 gut bacteria have have a big play in that like metformin actually modulates gut flora and they think that is maybe the biggest uh secret to how metformin works Mm -hmm. but there was just a study on resistant starch with uh they had 40 women who were various degrees of insulin resistance and uh they fed some resistant starch and some not and uh all of the women that were fed the resistant starch improved their insulin sensitivity and that was a pretty big study because they're they're uh they've been applying to the FDA for health claims for resistant starch on on different foods and supplements and so that study will probably put the FDA over you know with the uh, with the uh, to to be able to allow them to have health claims for resistant starch but yeah, so it's just the whole thing, you know, the whole food concept and, and how it, it improves your gut bacteria and just the way your body handles carbs in general, the whole, you know, it's the whole picture. Yeah, and the last thing I wanted to talk about, and I guess I can lump these together, is uh, it, over the, I would say the last year, maybe last year and a half, there's been a lot of talk about gut health, and then that's kind of morphed into the microbiome, and it turns out that potatoes again, are one of those things that help us with that whole, those two things, the gut health and the microbiome. And I just wanted yep. you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I mean, you you can't click on the Internet without seeing an article on gut health now. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they're linking gut health to things like depression, anxiety, autism, schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, Crohn's disease, obesity, you know, colon cancer. Just everything is linked to the gut now and uh arthritis you know and, and everything's linked to the gut and uh this there's this brain gut connection and you know people are realizing now how important it is to have a healthy gut and the only way you're going to have a healthy gut is to feed the gut bacteria some food that they like and the food that they really like is fiber and uh one of the greatest sources of fiber is potatoes and so yeah potatoes are great for gut health and uh if you cook your potatoes first and then cool them down, they form that resistant starch, then you can reheat them and eat them. So just a simple little trick like that, you know, like triples the uh, amount of fiber that's in a potato, and you don't notice any difference in the taste, but it's uh, it's like a real banquet for your gut bacteria and uh, a good way to get started, you know, toward getting a healthy gut. Yeah. This has been a great interview, Tim, and the book is filled with so many good things. You did a, a really great job of uh, researching uh, a lot of the no, stuff, thanks. especially the science and going into your story and how you discovered everything. So it's a really, really, really great book. Um, where can people who are interested in this potato hack get the book to learn more about the diet, learn more about the science behind it? Yeah, probably the best way is it's on Amazon. And it's called the the Potato Hack, and the subtitle is Weight Loss Simplified by Tim Steele. It's on Amazon in both paperback version and Kindle. And also, if you go to Barnes and Noble, you can go online or you can go into any Barnes and Noble store and ask for it. They can get it for you. And uh, yeah, it's out there. You should be able to find it pretty easy. Yeah. Are you going to be doing? I, I'm not. Yeah. I think you don't have a website. I wasn't able to find it. But are you going to be? putting out a website of this and maybe doing some coaching, helping people uh, coach people through this. I've got a blog called uh, vegetable farm, 
spelled okay. like P H A R M Vegetable Farm. And uh, we talk about the potato hack a lot on there. And I have another blog called thepotatohack.com. And then we also have a Facebook page. If you just go to Facebook and type in the potato hack, uh, I, I kind of try to put updates on there pretty much every day when I find them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so my blog or the Facebook page, you can find all kinds of information and talk to other people who are doing it and uh, share your experiences. Yeah. Hey, man, I enjoyed it. It's been real. I'm so glad we got a chance to connect on um, Facebook and get you on. I'm always looking for something that's new. And uh, I'm having another show in June with a woman who actually, uh, I don't want to say cured, but actually put her diabetes into remission using fruit. So it's like this whole oh, recurring great. theme, yeah, with potatoes and weight loss. And, you know, you think of potatoes are something that might have made you gain weight. Now I'm changing my perspective. And, and even with her next month, we'll be talking about fruit and how to uh, resolve your diabetes. So it's, it's it's great that a lot of these things are coming to light and changing perception out there about what people can do to finally kind of gain control with their health. So, again, man. Thanks for being on. I really, really enjoyed it. Well, yeah, Darren, thanks for having me. It was, uh, it was a good time. Thanks. All right. Have a great night, Tim. Okay, you too. Okay, thank you. All right. It's a potato hack, Tim Steele. And um, this Wednesday, we're going to have Micro Miracles with Dr. Ellen Cutler. If you remember Dr. Uh, Cutler was on the show, I think, was my first year when I started the show back in 2013. Uh, she came on uh, Clearing the Way to Health and Wellness, where we were talking about uh, food sensitivities. So uh, she's going to come back on, and we'll be talking about micro miracles and the, uh, the healing power of enzymes. A lot of people out there, as you age, you lose enzymes, and that might be some of the reasons why we are having a lot of issues, digestive issues, a lot of people are premature aging, and we'll be talking to Ellen Cutler, Dr. Ellen Cutler, on the power of enzymes. So tune in, same fat time, same fat channel, Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday. Peace and love, y'all. Thanks for listening. Why is it that when someone asks you to just trust them, you just don't? Because trust is tricky. You can't just say it. You have to back it up. AAA Auto Insurance has been doing that for over 100 years. As quickly as a car accident happens, AAA starts to set things right, matching you with the right experts who make your claim their priority until you're back behind the wheel. Talk to a AAA insurance agent at your local AAA store today or visit AAA.com slash insurance to learn more about AAA. 160,000 miles. That's on average how often you'll use your car insurance. But what if you could get help with more, more often? Maybe save a couple of bucks on clothes or at restaurants. What if you could even get rescued roadside when a tire goes flat or your battery dies? You can, when you're a member and your auto insurance is AAA. Insurance that's not just insurance. Talk to a AAA insurance agent or visit AAA.com insurance to learn more about how AAA works at every mile.